Before that, they rented apartments or they might have rented a home or whatever was necessary. Now, they were living at the time in Bellevue, Pennsylvania, and they bought this home in Valencia, Pennsylvania, which was between Butler and Pittsburgh. And I mentioned the fact that I was going to go down and help them move on this particular day that they were moving. And one of the men of the church came to me and said, Phil, if you want to exchange vehicles, you can have my truck to go down to help them move. Boy, oh, I thought that was a good idea. Well, I really appreciate Don. His name was Don, too. So I went down, to, we exchanged trucks, and I went down to Elgin, Pennsylvania to help Dan move, which is about 15, 20 miles away from where he was living. I said, Dad, I got this truck. What can I do to help you move? He looked at me and says, Phil, there's a room downstairs where I have things stored. Why don't you move everything from that room and put it in the shed on the new home where we're uh, building? I said, sure, I'll do that. So Vera and I went downstairs. We opened up the room that he had the thing stored. It was an apartment complex, and there was about five or six rooms in it, but this was his room. And I was shocked. Dad was one that changed his own oil in their cars. And he never threw an empty oil can away. In that room, there was box after box after box of nothing but empty oil cans. And I went upstairs and said, Dad, do you really want those things moved? Why don't you just let me take them to the dump, which is just down the road? He said, no, I want them in that shed on the new property. So there and I spent the whole day Packing up this pick pickup truck with empty oil cans and transporting them to their new property. 
I found out several years later that Dan later on, maybe a year or so, had paid somebody to come with a truck and to take them to a, a, a dump. For the life of me, I have no idea why Dad saved all those empty oil cans. If you recall, back in those years, they were paper, not plastic. Why would he save them? I even asked him one time why he saved those empty oil cans, and he just shrugged his shoulders and says, I don't know, I just didn't want to throw them away. Down through the years, I have used that illustration to illustrate the idea that when we as Christians have been saved with the blood of Christ, we have been saved for a purpose and not like an empty oil can. God saved us for a reason. And there is a job that needs to be done for the glory of Christ. Now before we go too far, I want to make something clear. I firmly believe that we're saved by grace through faith. There's nothing we can do in our life that will justify our salvation. Not a thing God did at all when Christ died. And we need the faith in order to be able to show our relationship to God. The second thing that I want to make clear is the idea that I believe faith without works is dead. That we show our faith by the things that we do. And if we are not busy in God's kingdom, then we have a problem with our faith. I, I, I'm going to put it this way. I am not... I don't have my works in my life because to gain salvation I do the things that I do as a Christian because I have been saved. There's a difference. When we're saved by the blood of Christ there's a love that develops. We love him because he first loved us. We are saved with the idea that, that our lives now become a means of glory to Jesus Christ. And the things that we do, we live in a glass house, so to speak. And the things that we do will demonstrate the faith and the love that we have for Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not the judge, nor do I claim to be the judge. But I firmly believe that there's a place for every worker in the kingdom of God. And no matter how, what our age, there's always something for us to do for the glory of Christ. With that being said, I, I believe that there's one chapter in the Bible that speaks out very clearly on this, and that's the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. It is, happens to be one of the greater chapters of the Bible that are lesser known. Now, I had no idea that uh, what was going to happen with Mike and his family when I, I wrote this sermon. And the first part of that chapter begins, I'm going to be reading from the NIV, and I want to read the first ten verses of this chapter by way of introduction to the thought. Beginning with the very first verses, and now we know that if, if the earthly tent in which we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed with our heavenly glowing, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed upon with our heavenly glowing, so that while so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, listen to the fifth verse. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose. Notice God has made us for this very purpose. And has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. 
Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to be pleased Him. We make it our goal to please Him. Whether we are home in the body or away from it. And I love the tenth verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one might receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Notice that tenth verse. What is the judgment? It's we done a uh, judge upon the basis of what we have done. The things done while we're here. And I think we ought to remember that. The rest of the chapter, Paul describes why he is motivated to do the things that he's doing. I, may I share with you that very early in my ministry, this particular chapter, the three verses that I'm going to bring out in the remaining part of the chapter have been goals of my life. And I want to share with you those goals. First of all, the 11th verse. I want you to look at that. It says, Since then we know what it is, what it is to fear God, fear the Lord. We try to persuade men what we are is plain into God, and I know it is also plain in your conscience. I like what the King James says. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I want you to think just for one moment. The terror of the Lord. The fear of God. God, Paul had just emphasized in the 10th verse the judgment that we're going to be judged according to the things that we have done. I don't think we need to fear what God's going to do for us. But what about our friends? Our neighbors? Those that are not Christ? I think people are willfully ignorant of what the Bible has to say. And in this particular day and age, when we see so much being done that is contrary to the Word of God, I think we're living in a time of willful ignorance. I don't want to know because I love what I'm doing now. And I'm going to do what I do because it's me, not you. I have a woman on Facebook that I read all the time, look at all the time. And there are times that the hair in the back of my head, I don't have any hair on the top of my head, but the hair in the back of my head stands up for the things that she's promoting on Facebook. I want you to think just for a moment. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of Christ? And if the righteous scarcely be saved by the skin of our teeth, if we are scarcely saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner be? Hebrews 10.31 it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, God, of the living God. I think we need to be concerned about those who are not Christian. We ought to be concerned about those who have no hope. The second verse that comes to mind is the 14th verse. And I love this. You go to the, a place of St. Mary's Hospital and waiting room, you'll see this on the wall. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all are dead. I want you to think. What we do, we do because of God's love. Christ's love. His love ought to be a motivating factor of our heart and our life as we go about doing good. 
many years ago, I, I served the church, and I, I, I cannot remember where it was that I served this church. I mean, I remember the occasion. There was a man in that church, and I have him pictured, but I can't place the church that he was. Long to. They used to get a magazine, and I believe the magazine was Look Magazine, and that's a long time ago, a long, long time ago. But I got looking through the Look Magazine, it gave me a lot of sermon material, a lot of illustrations. And I can remember the one article that I read, and I was extremely captivated by it. It was what our young soldier boys did during the Korean conflict for rest and relaxation. Many of them could not come home for a furlough in the United States, so they went to Japan. And one of the article stories they told was about this young man who became captivated with several Catholic sisters, nuns. Say what you want to about their doctrine. This illustration is perfect for what I'm thinking about. But these nuns were involved with a leper colony. And this young man had never seen lepers, and he got interested in what they were doing. He watched them as they changed the banding and the dressings on some of the wounds of leprosy. And they, the article said that he was very nauseated by the sight of some of these people that were eaten up with so much of leprosy that they were pitiful to look at. And after spending several hours watching these nuns take care of it, he looked at one of the nuns and said, you know, I will not do what you're doing for all the money in the world. And she turned around and she said, neither would I. What she did because of the love of Christ. When you see somebody dying in sin. When you see somebody lost in a crisis world. Does the love of Christ compel you to speak up to them? To lead them away, not in judgment, but in love. In love. The last verse. Is down in the 20th verse. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and though God were making his special his appeal through through us, we implore you on be, Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Notice the idea we are the ambassadors of Christ. Let me assure you that you're the only sermon. For the glory of Jesus Christ that some people in this world will ever see in our community. It's how you live and how you do and what you say and how you react. That's going to tell them about your relationship to Christ. What is it? What is it? In the last verse that I want to call your attention to is in the very first verse in the next chapter. And I don't know why the end of the chapter was uh, 20th verse verse. It says, then we then as workers together, because we know the terrible Lord, because we know the love of Christ, because we know we are the ambassadors, we persuade man and work in the kingdom of God for the glory of God. Several years ago, I preached in Titusville, Pennsylvania. While I was there, some of the churches got together and started another church in Conneantville, Pennsylvania. This church struggled. The church had a lot of difficulty. Oh, they might have had 30, 25, 30 people. I'm not sure how many. They met in the house, and the front sun porch of the house was where they met and had their worship service. Good people, lovely people. But as I came down to preach in the Huntington area, 
The talk among the ministers was to encourage them to close up and join in with the church in Meadville. And it was being considered. But after I came down to the Huntington area, I heard that the church was having a picnic at Conneaut Lake. And they were just having a great time. Boy, they were enjoying themselves, swimming, playing badminton, whatever they wanted to do. Some of the older ones just loved to sit around and talk, like we all do. Came to a time to eat the picnic lunch. They started looking around for the preacher so he could have the blessing for the food. Give thanks for the food. He was nowhere to be found. And they began to search and to look. And they couldn't find him. So about 10 of the people got together. And they started going through the shallow part of the lake with their hands joined together on one end of the swim beach to the other. See if they happen to find. But halfway through that little search where they had their hands joined together, they found his body at the bottom of the lake. He had drowned. When I heard that, I thought, well, that's the end of the church. They'll probably close up. But down through the years, they stayed there. And they worked. Several years ago, when I was preaching at the Chesapeake Church right across the river, <coughs> a young man showed up that I had not known. I went back and talked to him. And here he was, the minister of the Conyotville Church of Christ. He was one of the Timothys of the Chesapeake Church, and they had called him to be his minister. I said, how many are you attending? He said, oh, we're the largest church in that part of Pennsylvania now. And I was just thrilled to death to know that they had grown so much. And then I said, I remember when I came down the Huntington area, that they lost their preacher in a drowning accident. Whatever happened to his wife? I was concerned she was a lovely person. And he just grinned from ear to ear and said she's still coming to church. She teaches Sunday school. She's the secretary of the church. And it's because of her that the church has grown as much as it has. She's responsible for over a hundred people having accepted Christ down through the years. And the people of the town of the church just love her to death. Here was a woman who could have thrown our hands up in despair and says, I've lost my husband. We were serving the Lord and look what he did. But she took the occasion to be able to witness for Christ. And as that preacher said, it was because of her, and only her, that the church grew to the proportions that it has. I think there's a special place in heaven for people like that. A special place. We're workers together here in Highland. We have a job that we need to do. We know God's terror. We know the hell is an awful place. We know God's love does not want anybody to perish, but to come into the knowledge of the truth. We are God's ambassadors in this community. May we let it be known that Jesus saves and the people need to come to Jesus. We're going to be singing our song of invitation. If there's one here that needs to accept Jesus as their Savior, we ask that you come. To believe, to repent, to confess, to be baptized. That you might rise and serve Jesus Christ with all you are, with all you have. If you need to place your membership here, or whatever it may be, we ask that you come as we stand, as we sing softly. Amen.